like to introduce Robin Trent. So one of the uh, problems here is to figure out what should be in the house. And you have to figure, you want to reduce it to the actual life functions that are going on in the building. And obviously the collections that were there were the typical historical society collections that are in every historic house in New England because when communities identified a house and focused their attention on it, everybody immediately donated all the pre-industrial stuff they owned to the house. So you'd have like 50 sets of andirons and uh, every straight chair, uh, all the fireplace implements because people had acquired cast iron stoves so they didn't need open hearth cooking stuff anymore. So that's exactly what was in your house of a broad date range dating up to like 1840, 50, 60. But we wanted to focus in more on the new date assigned to the building, which is 1699, based principally on, well, first off it's based on the fact that none of the information published in the 1930s about the house had any foundation. Uh, the author who came up with the theory that the house was built in 1649 in South Hold and moved out here later on, all that, they were all fabricated documents and account books which no one has seen since. So the guy probably made them up. Uh, secondly, uh, the internal evidence of the building itself should have suggested that it was later rather than earlier. Uh, the extraordinary height of the rooms. Uh, the only comparable house other than the one in Orient to this building is the 1684 Capon House in Topsfield, which was built new for the town minister and his wife who came from a prominent Ipswich family. So in local folklore, she was regarded as a snob, you know. Uh, but they built the same thing, a little, a little kitchen and a big, big parlor. Now in that particular case, uh, they think there may have been an outshot behind their kitchen, but you didn't have that here, or at least whatever evidence there was, was, uh, you know, obscured when they restored the building in 1938-40. They wanted to restore it strictly to the 1699 date. So the lean, I'll show you later on, all the lean-tos and other stuff that had been added onto the north side of the building were taken away. And that's too bad because it, it meant that the poor lady doesn't have any place to put all of her stuff when she's cooking, you know, and we'll see that. That's a big problem in terms of your little teeny kitchen. Uh, also, uh, most people don't understand that the kitchen door was the principal exit and entry. You, most of what went on in the house, people didn't use their front door very often. Um, so we have to think about the population of people who were in the building. I think probably um, the husband, his wife, Joseph Wickham, his wife, Sarah Satterley, was that her name, Sarah Satterley? Um, probably had three, four sons alive at that point. Um, he may have had apprentices for his tanning business, and they probably owned two, three slaves. And she may have also had a young woman indentured to her as a servant, you know, which was not uncommon to put out teenage girls as, as servants. Um, so that gives you a, a population of 10, 12, 13 people living in this building, uh, which imposes, you know, un, un, unfortunately because of the super steep stairs, it's probably not a good idea to take people upstairs anymore. And they don't do that at the Ipswich Historical Society in Massachusetts. They don't take people upstairs. It's just too scary, too dangerous. The steps are too strange. So basically you're constrained to... Uh, interpreting the first two ground, the ground floor rooms, okay. 
Um, so the teeny, teeny kitchen here called a keeping room, which was not a period term. It would have been hall, probably, hall or kitchen. And uh, uh, kitchen became more common after 1700 and uh, parlor. And then later on in the 18th century, even families out in rural areas would move their bed upstairs and then a parlor became more like a purely an entertaining space, you know. Um, also, because you have a teeny kitchen, you don't eat in there. You eat out here. So that, that's part of the furnishing plan. Now, the way they had it before, there was, you know, a set of chairs and everyone was supposed to be sitting around the kitchen table. I don't think that happened here. There's too many things going on in that kitchen for, for you to sit and eat there. Now, here you see the, the lean-to. This was probably added in the 1730s when Joseph Wickham Jr. inherited the house. And immediately he knew from living in the house that there just wasn't enough room there uh, for the kitchen function. So a lot of this lean-to, uh, I think he took the, at least in this drawing, they don't have the, the doorway that is closed up, see? because they probably had a door on the back of the lean-to. Um, but that gave the kitchen uh, a buttery, which is where you keep the butts of uh, cider and beer, small beer. This is, this is like very low alcohol content beer that people drank as every day. They didn't drink water out of a well. They wouldn't do that. Uh, and also, you know, there has to be a milk room and there has to be uh, other storage of, of foodstuffs, which there just was hardly any. So we're stuck with trying to do all of that in the little teeny original kitchen, but it's too bad that they decided to tear off that lean-to because it was, uh, you know, they lost a lot of interpretive space when they did that. Okay. And here, here it was when they f found the building, you know, with barn, it was turned into a barn barn door, the kitchen door was closed up in the 1730s, uh, sash windows, still had the original, that's what drew the WPA guy when he was coming down the road up here and the trees had all fallen down from the hurricane and he saw that and that's why he went over and started looking at the house, you know, so that that's, that's actually what happened, so it's very unusual to preserve the original uh, pilastered uh, chimney top like that. And also, this is in the lean-to, while it was still there, another important thing about your house is that the, it preserved, some of the original casements were preserved under the lean-to and also some of the original clabberds. And there was marsh grass insulation, or some sort of grass, stuffed in between the joists. A lot of that was eliminated when they restored the building. So as it presently stands, the building is partly architectural museum and partly period room because they left all the studs exposed inside. So we're now considering sort of figuring out temporary pseudo plaster to put on the insides, at least of a couple of the rooms, to show that, that wouldn't, the studs would not have been showing originally, because it looks like people go in the building and it looks like summer camp, or you know, it doesn't, doesn't compute. There was also some ambiguity because when they restored the building, they found some of the original molded sheathing reused as sub-boarding sub on the outside of the house. So they weren't sure whether the walls were plastered or board sheathed. So they may have hesitated about restoring it. But I think they also wanted to show the beams. You know. Here we are. See, here's the whole lean-to. And then there was this other outshot. In Dutch, they call weird additions outshots. And they often, sometimes they would say that in English, to outshot. So this is uh, the lean-to plus this thing. Here's some, I don't know if these are cases or who they are, 
standing in behind the building before the restoration. Anyway. They look like they're from the er, seven, 1870s, you know. What was in that building, sir? Huh? What was that building used for the yacht shop? I have no idea. Probably for some sort of storage. I'm not sure. Don't you think? They didn't record it too much when they did the drawings. This is the kitchen, and these were the doors that were punched through the rear wall to that lean-to when it was built. So they, they obviously, this, this room must have been pretty substantial. It may have been for storage, probably maybe for barrels. And then this one went into this ambiguous space behind the chimney, which is still there, and sort of went out in... They probably cut the lean-to up into three or four rooms, you know, that was quite typical. Now the other thing that's amazing about this house is the presence of both up and down braces. You see these here, going both up and down in the two ends of the building, the east and the west ends of the building on the second floor. And that's not present in any other 17th century Anglo-American building. And it's an over-construction, in other words. And uh, there's some idea that perhaps they did that because they thought there would be super strong gales coming off the ocean. Uh, I'm not aware if the house at Orient has those or not. You know, they may, it may underneath the, the walls. I don't know if anybody's ever investigated it to see. And here we are with the the typical accumulation of stuff that uh, was put into these buildings when they were restored. You know, it was sort of an outpouring of community feeling that they brought all this stuff in. Uh, but on the other hand, at, at this juncture, 70 years later, or whatever it is, 60 years later, it's, it, it's not a, it has nothing to do with the building, really. Uh, and some of the chairs were from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, or they're not from around here. So uh, they have no necessary connection to the building. Uh, they always had to have spinning wheels and linen wheels because nobody did that anymore. And you know, any crate, but probably up like six or eight cradles in the collection, they all would give cradles. Because um, we're gonna, I'll talk about a cradle that we're making that's more appropriate to the building. Now, I'm putting this in because, as I was saying when we were filming today, the reason people came here as early as 1639-40 were a couple of reasons. First, um, the English and the Dutch were jostling for control of Long Island, for one thing. And secondly, the Native Americans, the Mont Montauquets, who lived scattered around the North and South Forks, were the premier makers of wampum. And this strikes us as like trivial, but in point of fact, it was very important because, partly because wampum was used in diplomatic negotiations, but also wampum was used as a form of currency in the fur trade. So everybody wanted to get control of these poor little people around here. That's why they built that Fort Korchog to defend themselves because everybody was after them. <clears throat> Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Haven, Narragansetts, uh, uh, Pequots, Mo Mohawks, they were all after them, you know. Um, so it's really not uh, trivial that they were making this wampum. It was, the, it was known throughout the Northeast as the highest quality uh, material. This is a belt I'm not sure which treaty this commemorates, but uh, there is some very early wampum that survives. There's the 1680-something one, the William Penn one. You know, the, you've seen prints of him underneath the Shackamaxon tree, you know, that William Penn painting of him talking. There was a belt made for that, and there's a very famous Five Nations belt the Sir William Johnson got from the, 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 the uh, Iroquois, five mate. So, the, you know, I don't know of a, a major belt that survives from the eastern Long Island because they didn't have enough power to negotiate a treaty. They were always clients to somebody else. But in any case, that show, you know, 
we need to get some wampum beads and the, the quahog is where the purple comes from and the whelk is a snail, the central column of that is what they make the white ones from. All laboriously hand polished and then bored, the holes were bored from each end of the bead with a little stone awl. And the Native Americans knew the difference between real Native American wampum beads and the Dutch imitations, because they, 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 they saw the workmanship. You know. uh, and there are references to uh, wampum being made in Albany and New York. You know, they were white people making it for the fur trade. So, so we, the problem is that Native American people who make wampum today by hand, they don't want to sell the individual beads. They want to sell uh, replica belts like this. So it's, it's a little difficult, but we'll figure it out. And this is the Fort, Fort Korchog. So obviously the name of the town is a garbling of of the, the native name. And all of these tribal names and associations are uh, problematic because as soon as whites came in here, they wanted to negotiate with one dude. So let's get a hold of Wyandonk at, uh, at the end of the South Fork there, and you know, we'll talk to him. You know, you, all, you guys all have to do what he says. You know? so, it may be that they uh, exaggerated his authority over all these other groups around here in order to negotiate with them, you know. And furthermore, and uh, Kutchog has a, a special mess in the form of William Wells, who was a trained lawyer, and he somehow lodged a suit against the Kutchog Indians and got some kind of a deed out of them, and it took 15 or 20 years for the town of Southhold to buy out his interest before anyone could buy lots out here. So it wasn't until they settled that in court that people could come here and sell because they wouldn't come out here until the deeds was, was figured out. <laughs> that's, that's true. Uh, and his, his box, his slant-lidded box, has been at the what's now called the Brooklyn Historical Society since the 1880s. So at some point we want to make a copy of that. And also uh, the Holden family, Holt, Hold, Hort, Hort, Holden, Horton? Horton family chest is at there too, Car, carved chest. Those are both you know, specific to this township. Oh, this is another view of more of the typical historical society stuff. Sir? Pardon me. The prior slide had numbers and notations. I could you enumerate the fort. The fort. Yeah. Yeah. These are these are. This is from an archaeological report, and there were like two or three um, digs there, and these indicate the cross sections that they dug trenches across. But they didn't really, you can see they really were very careful not to disturb the site a lot. And in all the archaeological things say, you know, this fort is the most intact of any of them. So that's a big deal. Okay, now one of the first things we wanted to make for the hall or the kitchen is a settle. Now people get the wrong idea because there are great big heavy English settles built into the walls and a lot of inns and pubs in England and people see them and think that's what a but this is a light thing made of three-quarter inch pine boards that the wife could move around because that kitchen door was open a lot of the time and the, the, the boards go all the way down to the floor. You see that in the back? It's, a, it's to block drafts so you don't get whoosh of air coming in and flare up the fire in the kitchen. So we made one of those right away. This is, a, this is one at the uh, Cogswells Grant in Essex, Massachusetts uh, that was in New England Begins, actually. And we went, I went there with Peter Follinsby and we measured it and copied it, so you have one. We have to trim the bottom of the one here, though, because the floor's slanted. So when Peter comes with your cradle, he's going to have to trim the base so it sits upright again, because it wants to tip over now. <laughs> okay, because the floor's slant away somewhere. Here it is when we first delivered it, and 
they had it shoved against the wall, but it really should be 90 degrees to the fire to block the draft from the door. And this is Peter assembling the dresser. We copied, I think we may have a slide of the prototype for this. These were always built in situ, you know, because they're too big to get in the door. And they're built to go around the beam. See that? So it goes around the beam. The prototype was built around a beam, too, uh, with scalloped shells of different depths and a storage, open storage area and a cupboard. But here he is starting to assemble it, OK? And just get, got more and more crazy. It was a thunderstorm day, and the power kept going off. Were you there then? No, I heard about it. Yeah. And here he is putting on the backboards. He screwed on the backboards, because no one was going to see it. But uh, otherwise, it's all nailed together. And there it is, sort of assembled. He hadn't gotten the, he didn't have the storage unit built in there yet. And here it is put in. And we modified the design somewhat. We put a plain door, changed the scalloping, changed the profile to early it up. The one we copied is about 1740, so we just earlyed it up to, to be more like 1699, 1700. So there's drawers, and oh, these are, uh, three glasses which Mac and I donated. These were made by period designs in Yorktown, Virginia in the 1990s. They're copies of a German drinking glasses. This one's called a Schneller, and it's got a trailed thread glass so it isn't slippery because you pass it around drinking beer. So you don't want it to be slippery. And then these are, uh, I forget what these are called, but they have prunts little applied uh, wafers on there to keep them from being slippery. Too. So you can't get those anymore. Well, there's some made in Czechoslovakia, but they're inferior. So these are, you know, you can't get these now. So that's something we wanted to give. Okay. And then uh, we acquired some pewter from a dealer. These are mostly 18th century plates, but close enough, you know. You, you know uh, but this display will be augmented with all the ceramics that we're going to acquire. This was before the ceramics arrived, I think, yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, and then here we are when they were arrived. So uh, these are copies of North Devon uh, cups from England and uh, porringers. Uh, there's a row of porringers. There's some more glass. And these are little vials for drugs. Uh, a, f a watering can for the herb garden outside a footed vessel for cooking. It isn't 100% yet, but it will be. Now, there were other objects with histories in this area that we went to look at. We're not going to reproduce this chest, but this was owned in uh, East Hampton, probably about 1640 to 1645. And it was made, we think, by a guy in Branford which at that time, Branford, next to New Haven, which was called Totoket at that point. And this guy, Mulliner, was in Totoket before John Davenport and Theophilus Eaton arrived with the Puritans in 1640. And he had decades-long lawsuits and fights with the New Haven authorities who were trying to he said, I have Indian deeds. I was here in 1638. You don't tell me who owns my land. I tell you who owns my, you know, big fights back and forth with me. Uh, I think he may have been an alcoholic. But, uh, and there are lawsuits later on where he wasn't training his apprentices properly. But one of the funny things about this guy is that we have never seen the back of a piece of furniture as rough as this. So the inside of the chest is perfectly planed and finished, but he left the backs of the panels right split right out of the tree, like wham. So, uh, and he did that with the, uh, is the next slide there? I think there's an interior. Yeah, there it is. You see the rough, rough stuff. I think Mac took this picture. And that's a descendant of the original owner uh, that was with us then. Oh, here's inside the chest looking down. And the backs of these panels are nailed inside the front of the framework, and there's the rough stuff again. And that's kind of weird. You don't want to leave rough surfaces inside the chest where it would snag the clothing, but, you know, I guess Mulliner was having a bad day. Now, here is the chair 
that we made for the house. This is a copy of a New Haven chair that was still in the family till two years ago. And it was on loan at the New Haven Colony Historical Society. So we know that a lot of New Haven County furniture was owned over here. We'll see some more of it. So this would, was an appropriate chair for, for uh, us to copy for here. And that's Peter Follinsby who's making most of the furniture for the house. He's the leading expert in making this early furniture from the log up, you know, splits it by hand, the whole routine. Uh, whereas a lot of the other furniture makers will cheat. They'll, they'll put the wood through a planer and so you know, no, no, not That's not the way he does anything. It's all done by hand. This is the prototype for the square table we made for the parlor. This is at uh, East Hampton Historical Society. The base, the, this is real, this is real. The feet are restored incorrectly and the top's a Victorian top. But we knew the feet and the top to put on it because there are other comparable examples. Um, the feet are copied from the feet of a cupboard at the Metropolitan. And the top's copied from two or three other tables that still have their tops. So it's like a five board riven oak top with clamped ends peg, pinned down on tops of the posts. So there we are. And the squiggle paint's copied from a, a square joint table at the Metropolitan. It had squiggle paint on to look like exotic wood. Um, and this joint stool is copied from a stool that descended in an East Hampton family. It's now in a Texas private collection, and we copied that, made two of these. Oh, and this is the cradle that we're copying, a uh, splint cradle that was found in southeastern Massachusetts, like near the uh, Rhode Island border. And uh, it's got like a wooden rockers with a strut between them and a bottom and then they put the wicker cradle on they put a wooden bottom on top of that and Peter is making it right now so that that'll be a big addition to the uh, collection no one else has one of those now we get to the witch part now this is the the, the witch dolls the witchcraft dolls or the poppets here are unique in American Anglo-American, there's no other examples known. This is from an English catalog that I just gave a copy to you guys called Spellbound that was held at uh, Oxford, Ashmolean Museum maybe? In, uh, so these are English examples. This is a little Scottish poppet that was found built into the walls. It's basically just a little wad of toe crushed flax with a thing wrapped to make a dolly um, and built into the walls of a house to keep scare the witch out and uh, this is a German stoneware bottle and this council bought a period one this is the contents that came out of it uh, pins a felt heart with pins through it bent nails fingernail pairings hair clippings and often urine and then they plug it and build it into the walls uh, under the hearth or under the front door and that's supposed to, uh, iron is the thing that scares witches they don't like iron so uh, they it scares them away so if you think of the house it's a kind of a silly one-to-one -one idea the house is a, a human body so you know they they innumerable sermons would say this, you know, the door is a mouth and the windows are your eyes and the fireplace is your lungs and blah, blah. So these were all the points where a witch was thought to get in. So she's going to come in your door or down your chimney or, you know, the sort of invasion uh, psychosis. And that's what's going on here. Okay. So here are your three guys before restoration so well conservation we'll call it so there are three of them there's two adults made on fork sticks and this is the baby made on a corn cob and they are unbelievably important those are of international significance as witchcraft hysteria artifact 
and they were found built in the walls next to the kitchen door. So obviously, Mrs. or Mr. and Mrs. Wickham were freaked out about witches coming in the kitchen door, which is where, as I say, that was your principal access. Everybody comes in and out through that door, including neighbors who might be witchy, for all you know. And they also did atropophaic burn marks on the big kitchen lintel. There are deliberate burn marks on there with a hot, with a round hot poker, and they're not cooking accidents or something like that. So those are also anti-witch things. So these people were freaked out. Uh, let's see, yeah, and here they are after conservation, and they've all been, you know, carefully cleaned and put back in what looks like the original configuration. Of course, for the last 60 years, innumerable people, including kids, were allowed to fiddle around with these, and it's just like, ah, what are you doing? Because they thought they were just dollies, you know, and they would have innumerable sessions of, like, let's make your own dolly, and so forth. And one kid uh, wrote a face, you know, eyes, nose, and smiley face with ball and, paw, ball and ink pen on there, so the conservator got that out. Uh, and this is, this is a case that's in the closet in the parlor now, and this is the Bellarmine German stoneware jug to show the witch bottle idea. And the horseshoes are, you know, today we think of them as this hardy, hard, good luck thing, but in the period they often nailed old iron things, including worn out horseshoes, they'd nail it in concealed portions of the house frame as the house was being put up. So there is one that was found in Topsfield, Massachusetts, when they were restoring a house of comparable date range at 1690s. And when they tore down a 17th century house in Southampton here in the 1870s, they found a horseshoe. And they knew what it was. They knew it was an anti-witchcraft thing. I mean, they said that in the, when they described finding it. So people knew what this stuff was, it, you know. Yeah, and here's, uh, this is from the Spellbound thing. When the uh, house in Orient, the early house in Orient, the guy rebuilt the chimney stack because it was falling down, and he found a dried cat in it. And that's an anti-witch thing. This is one from England. They built it right into the masonry, and it's thought to chase witches away. Sometimes rats, too. There's a little rat buried in the, in the masonry. Yeah? Uh, the... the uh clay pipes that were found in the walls. Yeah. Um, what could have been the reason for, for that? Well, I, I, don't, I haven't seen reference to those being used as atropophaic, uh, you know, anti-witch things. They may have been incidental during construction, just, you know, throw them in there. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, and these are English horseshoes covered with uh, little knit uh, coats and then stuck in the wall. So, you know, there's, there's international, and sh I'm sure if there was comparable research done in Germany and Scandinavia, they would find a lot of the same freaky stuff. It, it's very, very disturbing, you know, <laughs> stuff. You know. But you have some of the really most important evidence for it that would be cited in every single witchcraft thing from now on, once they're published, yeah. Those Die in the house and dry no, 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 no. They are they are dried up and built into the masonry. Oh, dried them up. Well, they built them in the. Well, they they dried them up, took their guts out, dried them up to a mummy, and oh. built them into the mason. They were literally built in the. Oh. You know, not didn't crawl in there to die or anything. That was what people used to think, mm -hmm. and they kept finding stuff in walls all the time. And they'd say rats dragged it in there. That was a typical. Shoes, all kinds of stuff, but those were all anti-witchcraft things. And they were dried before they were put in? Huh? They were dried before they yeah, were put in? Yeah, yeah. They're virtually like rawhide. Mm -hmm. Creepy. So what, I meant, to turn the other side, what would happen to people who allegedly became obsessed by these witches? I mean, obviously, people... Somebody was along the way obsessed by some kind of ghostly figure and therefore told other people that you must protect yourself. Yeah. And this is the way to do it. Is there any 
History on, on yeah, there have been there have been histories of American witchcraft, and certainly in Germany, there were witchcraft trials and outbreaks that were much more huge and widespread than anything we could imagine. There were like thousands upon thousands of people, and thousands and thousands of cats executed <laughs> for being witch familiars. Weird. Uh, in England, there, was, there were certain areas in like East Anglia during the Puritan period when there were very aggravated witchcraft outbreaks, and in Scotland as well, in, in the, where there were, uh, you know, the, the extreme Protestant uh, stuff. Um, and there were numerous silly books not silly, but they were purportedly serious witchcraft monographs that were written by both Catholic and Protestants. And when they had the Salem witchcraft trials, mm. these ministers were sitting here reading these crazy books, uh, trying to figure out, you know, how do you detect, and, and, and that's when that whole question of spectral evidence came up. Uh, uh, whether you, whether you know, if, if a girl's screaming, I can see a bird on the beam, and it's it's Goody, what's her name, tormenting me, and they allowed that evidence, which was considered to be like completely crazy. Uh, afterwards, when the trials were ended, they were ended for two reasons. One was that they had declared a, a trial of Oye and Termine, and in theory, only the Crown could call a court of way. And so that was illegal, but also because the, the spectral evidence was thrown out as stupid. So uh, before they, they, they probably released 30, 40 people who were still incarcerated when the new governor came in and said, you know, that's it. Because they started to accuse the governor. And that's when he said, that's, <laughs> we're, closing this, we're closing this party down. But uh, obviously, you know, that, that kind of, this, these beliefs persisted well into the 18th century, even the 19th century. It's, it's very weird. Let's see, do we have any other images here? I, don't, I can't remember. That's it? Yes. Okay, here we go. These are people who supported the, particularly these guys, uh, supported the, the restoration and the purchases so far, but we also Actually, have... Century Arts did. Um, Century Arts, and that's one of the reasons why we have building. Oh, good. Okay, yes, but we're we still have a big want list that we're going to put together. I turn into a pumpkin at the end of October, I think. So, but I'm going to. There's going to be a want list for future acquisitions um, that to complete the the refurnishing project. You'll see the state that it's in right now, which is pretty good. But we have, uh, you know, like this month, I'm going to be making the textile fixtures and so forth. So, you know, one bit, bit by bit by bit. And I still have to uh, write the uh, text where we're going to publish a, maybe like a 28, 30 page pamphlet. Pam booklet about the new treatment. So, you know, and it will have some of this Native American. And, and also, we're going to I'm going to analyze the, the 1698 census of New York is a really important source because that's immediately before the house was built. It demonstrates they, they classified everyone as either white male, white female, black male, black female. And that shows that uh, the slave population of this area was about 12 percent. That's a lot. But most of them were house servants rather than uh, uh, agricultural workers. So it's, uh, you know. Now, it may be that um, Wickham trained his male slave to work with him at the, at the, the, the pits for curing the leather. You know, that, that may, may be the case, but we're not sure. We don't. We're, we don't we know from his will in the 1730s that he owned slaves. But if, if the ownership of slaves in this area as of the 1690s is any indication, they, just about everybody owned one or two slaves. That's a lot, you know, by New England standards. The only place where there was sort of like field gang 
plantation slavery in New England was in eastern Connecticut, western Rhode Island, and also some up in New Hampshire, where there were like what we would think of as plantation systems operating. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.